And we start the week with the paint drying and the grass growing in good order after last week's breakneck volatility in financial markets. But don't let that fool you. That's probably because nobody wants to take a bet before what is another big week of macro event risk. Nobody really wants to stand in front of it, it would seem. So what we're going to do is figure out what this macro event risk is and how it's going to perhaps impact financial markets from stocks to bonds to rates to currencies here. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro at Tasty Live. And we are going to take a look at uh, first the round of U.S. event risk that's uh, on the docket because there's quite a lot of it. Um, and then take a look at some stuff outside of the U.S. as well, uh, in Europe and in China, that should be uh, very interesting. In fact, even a little bit uh, from Canada, uh, in so much as it drives what we can think about the U.S. economy here. Uh, and so try to figure out where we are for these markets as we proceed because it does appear like we are at a key inflection point let's begin in the u.s uh, then we are needless to say overwhelmingly focused on the u.s cpi consumer price index inflation uh, data it is expected to give us a little bit of a faster pace of inflation at the headline number 3.4% there uh, would be an uptick uh, from the prior reading um, where it uh, came in at 3.2%. Um, and so we would be looking here at um, just kind of a wiggle higher. Uh, as we can see, uh, this metric has r r really been kind of anchored around these levels for a few months. Meanwhile, at the core, which excludes food and energy, a decline down to 3.7%. And uh, to put that in context, uh, that would be the lowest reading on this since April of 2021. So at the core, it looks like disinflation is expected to proceed in uh, good order. And this is really the quintessential question for the Fed. Because when we look at the headline, we can perhaps see how it is that we get that a little bit higher. The negative influence from energy has been waning for a few months now. And with the recent pickup in the price of oil, there does seem to be the possibility that it's going to continue to wane. Uh, the latest um, contribution from energy was... Um, negative 0 0.1 percentage points in the overall number. The goods component, also negative 0 0.1 percentage uh, points. We might see a little bit of an uplift into positive territory there, just as uh, the markets rebase. And so it seems like we could get a little bit of an adjustment to these things giving us that higher headline, but that need not be bad news for the Fed and bad news for disinflation overall, because as we can see here, the majority by far of the inflation that remains lives in the core services sector. So services excluding food and energy. And Needless to say, a big component of that is housing, and there's nothing that the Fed can really do about that because they've largely been the ones that have locked that market for both buyers and sellers with a rapid uh, policy of rate hikes meant exactly to deliver the disinflation that we see here. We got inflation down from 9% uh, or more at the headline uh, down to these levels with the Fed's uh, aggressive rate hikes certainly being an important contributor, if not the only contributor. And so we can obviously see that that policy has been at least to some extent effective, but 
it also has driven both buyers and sellers out of the housing market, keeping the price uh, from falling much more than um, it could. Because if anybody looks at the spread now between their outstanding mortgage and the average for those in the U.S. is less than 4%, and look at mortgage rates now, which are still north of 6%, and say, well, I don't want to refi and pay an extra 2 plus, almost 3%, depending on where I am uh, in my existing mortgage, that obviously keeps sellers out. If sellers are out, the price can't come down as much. That keeps buyers out, which are both um, looking at and getting sticker shock from the price of homes that isn't coming down enough and the higher mortgage rate. So instead, the Fed is focused on labor market. And we talked about this, uh, of course, last week in the context of um, the jobs report that came out on Friday. And we see that this still is really the main story for Fed policymakers because we can see that while overall inflation has come down, as we just mentioned, from over 9% to now under 4%, uh, and even core has come down from close to 7% to under 4 wage inflation, the employment cost index uh, here um, in the yellow, has come down less than 1%. And that's because we still have a significant shortage in the labor market. Now, of course, it's been cut significantly by about two-thirds from the peak post-COVID. There it was over 6 million. Now we're down to 2.3 here. But nevertheless, we are looking at a situation where there's still a much more meaningful disparity here than was the case before the pandemic, and that's probably structural at this point. And so what the Fed is looking to do is to slow labor demand, because obviously it can't so much do anything with labor supply. But in keeping rates higher for longer, it can ensure that there is more of a headwind from tighter credit on labor demand to try to close that gap and the inflationary implications therein. So that's really where we're looking here. And if the CPI data is going to tell us that the Fed is making some progress in this direction, that probably bolsters their call for cutting rates this year. And if not, then not. Now, of course, this is defining for financial markets because we can clearly see they've pointedly stopped rallying as we've gotten the market's own view of where policy is going to rest on the hawkish side of the Fed's outlook. So we can see here that this rally that begins for us late October, early November – starts as the amount of rate cuts in the system starts to swell. The gray bars here, Fed funds futures expectations for how many rate cuts we're going to get in 2024. And we see here that from late October, early November, through to the turn of the calendar year, we go from about three rate cuts to six. So you can see those gray bars go from about uh, down 75 basis points to down twice that, a percentage and a half, or 150 basis points. The Fed issues its own outlook in late December and has now reiterated it with the March update. They're seeing three cuts, 75 basis points. What we find from the start of January through to basically the end of the first quarter is that as long as there are more cuts that the markets expect than what the Fed is anticipating, risk sentiment can re uh, remain well supported. And so stocks keep going up as long as the market thinks that the money will be cheaper than the Fed is willing to acknowledge, at least for the time being, which basically means the Fed is going to have to shift to a more dovish setting 
and come the market's way. That means future money is going to be cheaper than the baseline anticipates. And so it makes sense to want to take risks as long as the economy doesn't fall apart. Worst case scenario, you lose money and borrow it back more cheaply. That sort of tailwind for risk sentiment goes away as soon as you durably get on the other side of the Fed outlook. So we can see here, once you make it over to the other side and the market is starting to bake in fewer cuts than the Fed, the S&P stops. It has now basically stopped rallying for the better part of three weeks. The Nasdaq, which is a little bit more rates sensitive, has been at a standstill for almost six weeks. And so we're looking at a situation now where the Fed is only expected, according to the markets, to deliver 53 basis points in cuts. That's two cuts and a very slight probability uh, of a third. If this CPI data comes out on the hot side, and signals the market is right, the Fed is wrong, when credit is going to be more expensive in the future, the Fed is going to have to adjust to that reality that probably is negative for stocks. It's probably positive for the U.S. dollar. It likely shifts the yield curve where the two-year yield goes up. If there is risk aversion, it may not necessarily be the case that it also shifts up long-end yields because if capital flows to safety, long-end bonds could actually be better supported than the front end. And whether that haven bid overpowers the adjustment in the overall rate structure to a more hawkish setting, we'll have to wait and see. And then, of course, if the data does suggest that the core side continues to disinflate, as is what is uh, expected, despite whatever... Uh, shenanigans at the headline because of energy, then maybe the markets get a little bit of an endorsement of the Fed's desire to want to cut. Rate cut odds come back out a little bit. Stocks can keep going higher. Dollar weakens some, etc. Now, if we look at the way that U.S. economic data has performed relative to expectations, the argument for an upside surprise seems compelling. This is data from Citigroup showing that U.S. economic data has started to reaccelerate relative to forecasts and is tellingly pushed through the 20-day moving average on the surprise index, which typically is some indication that there is follow-through in whatever d direction it's going. So you can see when it is going up and then breaks through, it tends to go lower. When it's going down and breaks up, it tends to head higher. We saw that here as well and here. So the setting here seems to be that the U.S. economy is still outperforming wherever analysts' baseline forecasts are, which makes the case for CPI coming in hotter. However, last week we saw the ISM Manufacturing and service sector uh, survey, and the manufacturing side is, of course, a minority of the economy, only about 20%. The service side is the majority. It was exceedingly weak, and most importantly, its prices component, which tends to lead overall CPI by about three months, fell to the lowest level since the COVID low from uh, early 2020. Now, that does set up a little bit of a pop in CPI here, but it also sets the stage for significant disinflation to follow. It's also the case that if the Fed is most worried about wage inflation, that the numbers we got from average hourly earnings, which actually continued to decline and came down to 4.1% in Friday's jobs report, set up a lead for the overall employment cost index to continue to go down. And so the wage inflation story actually seems to be in the Fed's favor. So perhaps the core does comply and then rate cuts can occur. So there's quite a lot of risk built up around these 
numbers and how the markets respond might be very telling for basically every major financial market for a while yet. Outside of the U.S., the main story is going to be a monetary policy announcement, shock of shocks, from the European Central Bank. They are at this point expected to be the most dovish of the majors, seen cutting by uh, nearly 80 basis points, which essentially suggests that at least three cuts are coming, 75 basis uh, points of them, and then uh, a fractional chance, less than even at this point, only about a fifth of a chance, uh, that we're going to get um, that fourth cut. But that's many more cuts than any of the other major central banks are currently expected to deliver this year. Now, if we look at the structure um, of when this is likely to occur, the setup seems to be that the market expects the first decline with about an 88% uh, chance to occur in June. So nothing this time, but then a cut in June, another one by September, and at least one other one by December, where you can see in d December, we're not quite at three, which would be four cuts. But we're about halfway there. And so we're somewhere in between three and a quarter and three by December. So we're tilting in the direction of that fourth cut, but it's not all the way there. So the message then for this ECB meeting might be stage setting. And it does make sense. If we look at where uh, CPPI uh, has been going in the Eurozone, what we see is that the indications from um, the recent data is that, first of all, we undershot expectations down to 2.4% versus 2 Point six expected that just came out last week um, the March update for um, Eurozone CPI and also the makeup of inflation has significantly broadened and so the very dramatic overstating uh, via the energy component this is um, right around the start of the war in Ukraine and the subsidies to energy that followed that's vanished and is now, as in the U.S., more of a deflationary force. The shock from food costs has significantly mitigated, and considering those tend to lead CPI by about seven months, there's quite a bit more f food cost falling to make its way into CPI that will continue to deflate that component, which was the biggest, or disinflate rather, which was the biggest uh, contributor to inflation last year by a long mile. That has now been outstripped by hospitality, which is the biggest contributor. And that, of course, is a function of the business cycle. It's very discretionary spending. And with an economy that's been contracting for nine consecutive months or eight consecutive months until this most revised um, CPI or uh, PMI data, uh, rather, uh, for March, allowed for the possibility that maybe we've reached standstill in the Eurozone, not growth with any kind of vigor, uh, then discretionary spending should unravel. And so the ECB seems well positioned. The surprise would be if they opt for a cut now. And that, of course, could weigh heavily on uh, the Euro, Needless to say, a signal uh, of near certain cutting in June would also go in the same direction, although perhaps uh, not as shocking, not as uh, punishing for uh, the euro than a surprise cut. Also on the menu, inflation data out of China. Um, we're expected to see a, a bit of a slowdown in CPI and deepening deflation in wholesale prices. Uh, again, signaling that the economy remains anemic and demand seems all but absent, despite some of the recent uh, green shoots that we've seen. So the world's second largest economy is still in dire straits. 
give expectations hold up. And that, of course, is another story about why risk sentiment needs cheaper money in the future to hold up because the growth story really isn't all that exciting at the global level. And then finally, a monetary policy announcement from the Bank of Canada. And this is where they're um, expected to land by the end of the year. Uh, as we can see, their expectations have held very steady here, calling for somewhere between one to three cuts. So um, their rates at 5%, they're expected to hold at 5%. Uh, and the question will be, is there in fact some sort of uh, under the surface weakness in the US because Canada very much depends on the US for virtually its entire economy. 80% of Canadian exports or so go to the US. And so if the Bank of Canada is spooked and feels like it needs to cut more, that might be a barometer on what the US is doing and give us another Fed leading indication. And that is macro money for today. Of course, we're going to get deeper into all of this as the week progresses and break it down in uh, a more granular way. We're here every Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, uh, talking about uh, the Wall Street close and what it might mean going forward. Uh, I'm also on with Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays, on with Chris on Fridays for Futures Power Hour, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically lately about gold on uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See you tomorrow.